Hey, welcome back to Two Super Guys Trade Stocks. I'm Dylan. And I'm Vinny. And today we're going to talk about with Alibaba stock being back below $70 a share. Are we wrong? Are we complete and utter idiots that completely missed the boat? According to many of our YouTube comments on prior Alibaba videos, that is the case. We're going to talk about some of the issues facing Alibaba stock right now. I'm scared. Two Super Guys Trade Stocks. I, I, I can't believe we're back below seventy dollars a share again. That's the crazy part. Didn't just, um, what, what's the what's the guy that shorted Nvidia? I'm blanking. Oh, everything money, uh, Paul. Yep, yeah. I think they just bought more Baba, right? Did he? I have no idea. I have stopped following them. You know, R.I.P. Seth. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's crazy to think back that at one point in time, Alibaba was a, like a three hundred dollar per share stock. It's just it like boggles the mind at this point when you look back on that as we 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 sit here now below 70 and can't even get any sort of like uh, actual positive trend um and we zoom in on a year here we're, we're pretty locked in a, a little channel here as of now um which is you know i guess for my covered call strategies worked out well i'm i've definitely lost money on alibaba like a fair amount but if i hadn't done the covered call strategy it would have been much much more I think I've mitigated a significant portion of my downside, fortunately, because of that. What are your Excuse covered calls, a strike price? Because I'm too afraid to do it just on this uh, stock. I'd have to look at it. Mine just, most recent ones just expired yesterday. I want to say it was at 90, maybe. I can't remember. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. It, I, when I sold that, it was actually much higher. I don't know what the, the, the current, like, next price I'll, I'll sell at will be, depending on. You know, I, have to, I was supposed to do it yesterday. I just didn't get around to it. Got it. Um, spent four hours working on my car instead. Um, so free cash flow yield. Okay? We've looked at this before. We did this most recent Alibaba earnings video. Uh, it almost seems meaningless at this point. It, the numbers are so ridiculous. Uh, Alibaba right now has $168 billion market cap, $68.6 billion in net cash position as of last quarter, um, giving them like a little under $100 billion enterprise value insane um and the tw trailing 12 month free cash flow was 24.25 billion meaning a 24.3 percent yield effectively which is just crazy to be able to yield 24 percent on your money in and that has nothing to do with all their investments also that's just yeah that mm -hmm. which is even yep. grosser but yeah yeah absolutely We're gonna touch on their investments a little bit but these are some of the areas in which alibaba stock has really struggled okay i'm gonna break it down to a few different sections here so china macro all right um, we just recently received this week the latest GDP numbers for the uh, Chinese economy, and it came in above expectations. You know, um, China has had a phenomenal period of massive economic growth, um, and they've been slowing down of late, but they were still tracking right around this 5% target range as far as GDP. Um, however, within that report, there were some segments that were a little bit more worrisome. Um, particularly, they mentioned down here that, you know, the demand for homes is very frail and it's weighing overall momentum. Retail sales and, you know, kind of uh, consumer confidence are, are really intertwined there. So consumer Joe Tsai actually... is a big one there. Yeah. Yeah, there's something called the wealth effect. Um, Joe Tsai kind of touched on it a little bit in an interview that he gave here. Um, you know, obviously we have this property sector crisis that's been playing out for a couple of years now in Alibaba stock, all right? Um, or in Chinese economy and weighing on Alibaba stock, I should say, that they new prices, new home prices fell the fastest pace in more than eight years last month, all right? Property investment down 10%. Then we have the actual sales numbers tumbling 23%. That's those are some pretty big declines in the housing market, which in the Chinese economy is even more important than it is in the American economy. You know, we've talked about how in the U.S. about thirty percent of household wealth is tied to real estate. In China, it's like seventy percent. Yeah, the vast majority of household wealth is tied up in real estate, so they mm -hmm. feel that effect much more strongly than we do. And you know, if you're a little old enough to remember the 2008 financial crisis, just the effects that that had on the American economy, and that's half the impact from a proportional standpoint as it is for the Chinese economy right now. Just wild. Yeah, I will say I feel bad saying this, but I'd love to see those numbers in America because housing is so gross. And so ridiculously out of hand. I would love to see yeah. a twenty three percent decline in, in uh, numbers. I don't even care if my house went upside down. That's fine. I have s a bunch of money on the side. Just I would love to buy a property, but I can't. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, we're sitting at all-time highs here for home prices in the United States right now. Uh, despite the interest rate environment, prices for homes have still gone up over the last year. Um, you know, Evergrande, you know, they're, they're still in the process of liquidating the bankruptcy. This was just the news article from January of this year. Um, you know, don't forget the largest property developer in China went bankrupt the last couple of years. That was something that, you know, certainly had a effect upon, you know, the... Uh, Alibaba and other retail companies, it, you know, other massive property kind of developers like uh, China Garden uh, are also Mark, Market Garden. No, that's the invasion of uh, someone will correct me on this, but <laughs> <laughs> there's something Garden. OK, uh, and they're also fa- facing significant financial headwinds. Um, so this is Joe Sai talking about here. I actually gave an interview, but he's talking about how the the weight upon consumers of the Chinese economy, explaining that it makes up 31% of global production, but only 14% of consumption. So Chinese kind of, um, you know, individuals and households, they do, they produce like a two to one ratio for what they consume compared to the Americans, which, you know, it's like 70% of global consumption. <laughs> it's just wild how much uh, more of a consumer mentality we have here, as opposed to uh, the Chinese, you know, folks that have such a uh, save and invest kind of mentality. They were investing in real estate, which is the problem, is that now they're losing value of that real estate, and their much their household wealth is decreasing significantly. But they still have cash savings, so yeah. some point that I got unleashed. But right here, oh. I ha- uh, high savings and household cash is strong. Consumer confidence is low. No, that's really what you're facing there from a macroeconomic standpoint. All right, geopolitical risk. This has been another thing we've seen play out over the last couple of years, right? Um, we've seen the escalations in the U.S.-China trade wars. And, you know, this is another take on it. This is specifically talking about EVs and how overcapacity of EVs. Because EV market has really fallen off a cliff here in the United States. Um, and now you're seeing, you know, companies like BYD become like the world's largest producer, producer of electric vehicles. And there's this, you know talking point, I guess you could say, is consideration that this overproduction of capacity will continue to drive down prices because now they have you know, the ability to produce many times more EVs than there actually is a demand for in the market right now, even with these subsidies that still exist. But this is just another kind of little chapter in the entire trade dynamic you've seen play out. I have a couple. quick question, and I'm sorry, I'm, this is like two slides late. I want to make sure that I wasn't wrong. Is the housing crisis fueled by, because I know China has ghost cities where they just Mm -hmm. use debt to build an unbelievable amount of houses that are just empty that no one lives in, because that would create a huge supply and demand issue. So is that like spiraling this on top of the Evergrande bankruptcy? It's part of it. I mean, like I said, people in China prefer to invest in real estate, so they were buying homes that they had no intention upon occupying betting on the appreciation of the homes therefore you get a production of homes that no one was anticipating on living in so that's why you get these like ghost cities quote unquote the actual volume of these ghost cities i'm not really sure if there's like a um, it doesn't a look like there's a definitive number yeah yeah exactly and the other thing that really points out is you know trace it back to this three le- three red line policy that the chinese government put in to help curtail the overexpansion and leverage and the Ponzi scheme nature of these uh, real estate developers where they were requiring future investment in future properties to finish properties that currently had like under construction. And once once that policy was put in place to prevent this bubble from growing even more, that's when you really saw like the kind of you know emperor's clothes turned out to be nothing at all um, as far as like these these large Chinese developers. That's that's what really triggered that. So back to like this geopolitical risk, we still have this elevated tension between China and mm-hmm. Taiwan. Um, you know, th- this also plays in a little interesting here where we have now, you know, Taiwan Semiconductor, you know, moving a significant portion of their or building in, you know, a significant portion of foundries now in the United States, not only to get the Chips Act money, but also because they're trying to divest away from, you know, having significant exposure to you know, any cross Taiwanese straits, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, what's the one I want to say here? I don't want to say violence, but tensions, <laughs> unease. It's, they're building in Arizona too, mm-hmm. which is yeah. that's where I am. Kind of crazy. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so it, it, it also ha- don't forget that like we have a war taking place between Russia and Ukraine, 
And we have this you know, war between Israel and Hamas that over the last weekend potentially almost looked like it was going to escalate into a region-wide conflict. Uh, it sounds like Israel and Iran are in, in the, yeah, you hit me, I hit you back kind of phase, but nothing like really trying to be aggressive with each other as far as you know, having a major impactful war, if you will. Yeah, so Iran responded saying it wasn't an attack, it was an infiltration which I guess means they don't have to attack back. It just seems like they both don't want to do anything, so they both did mm-hmm. fake attacks to be like, yeah. oh, we're still strong. But And they yeah. they both agreed is what it seems like. But the this was like a New York Times thing like eight hours ago. They're calling it not an attack, an infiltration, thus they don't need a rebuttal, if you will. Yeah. It, it save the face sort of thing uh, but you did see a big spike up in oil prices leading into yeah. this and now we've seen that cool back down uh, but you have this kind of global you know uneasy environment uh, where you have commodity prices rising and china is a major importer of oil you know so that that's something that their economy feels uh, the brunt of more than you know some other folks right because they're, they're producing 31 percent of the global output uh, and largely a fueling that with oil uh, and coal. Um, Now, as far as Alibaba specific issues, this is another portion, right? You know, they have had a lot of turnover, right? So we just had a recent CEO appointed back in September, um, but we also had this restructuring program where they were trying to break up into the the six different units and reorganize there, and they were gonna IPO some of them. Don't forget this all started originally, originally with the Ant Group IPO that just never actually happened. Uh, so there's been a lot of turmoil within Alibaba itself, right? Um, we had this this kind of little episode where Daniel Zhang became the CEO of Alibaba Cloud and then was like quickly out within like, what was it, like two months, not even? It's getting like it was barely had time to unpack his office furniture. Um, and now they are backpedaling on these IPOs of all these logistics units because, you know, the Chinese envir- um, you know kind of economy right now is not doing super well. So you can't get these overinflated prices for IPOs. So it doesn't make sense to IPO something at this time, point in time where you can keep it on your balance sheet, keep it in-house, and then eventually, you know, IPO at a later date when things are doing better. As far as the company itself, we've also seen the kind of, when it comes down to the metrics, the revenue has been largely flat over the last couple of years, right? Like we're barely where we were in 2022 as far as revenue. And this includes them cannibalizing things where they, they've had become more the direct retailer as opposed to that consumer um, uh, customer v- management value or revenue, CMR v- revenue, which was the higher profit margin revenue we wanted to see. This is, as you would say, Charlie Munger saw them evolving into just a retailer as opposed to like a platform company, right? Uh, definitely an issue. Operating income, been sporadic. You know, they've still been making some operating income pretty consistently throughout this time. But as far as the growth, you're not seeing consistent growth like you were at one point in time. Uh, it's been all over the all over the map. Net income, same thing. This is where you start to see the, I guess, the weighing right now of um, the Chinese economy in general and the depressed valuations of all these other investments they have. Because they do carry a considerable number of investments and other things like Anchor Group on their balance sheet. Right? So they get a lot more variation in their net income. This is why like when Warren Buffett talks about Berkshire Hathaway earnings, he's saying to focus less on that and more focus on the operating income because it's a better metric of the actual underlying business and that this will fluctuate from quarter to quarter significantly. Mm. Um, but you know, we saw pretty pretty steep drop off here and we've seen some run up recently, but not nothing crazy. As far as positive news, uh, shares outstanding has been consistently declining. They are, you know, people say that like, oh, they're still giving away share based comp, which they are, um, but their share buyback pace has been aggressive enough that they are starting to like meaningfully chew up shares, which is something nice I like to see. Uh, That's one positive thing here uh, to kind of end the entire presentation on. But I wanted to give you like, what are your thoughts? You know, going back in a time machine, would you have bought Alibaba shares? And what is your plan going forward with your Alibaba shares? Well, you can't give me a time machine question because I would say, no, I would have bought NVIDIA. Yeah, and then I, I would the have I doubled down on NVIDIA when it hit $700. <laughs> and you'd be yeah. like, you're an idiot. <laughs> but it would have worked. Uh, well, except for yesterday. Um, <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's a 10-year hold. So I will say I had recently looked at all of my... Uh, calls that I have made where, you know, I, I, I bought a bunch of Bank of America. I bought Schwab, which people talk shit about for some reason. 
um, yeah. Ox, they had it all, every one of I've done, especially MD has been crazy successful, except for this one. Hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a 10 year hold. It's tough to expect a stock to go very high when the entire economy is having a bunch of issues. So, you know, this could be in an accumulation phase. I'm actually not against buying more, to be honest, at this price. It's just such, it's such a low price. And if I'm truly in a 10 year hold, who cares? Um, I know that you're not buying more. Yeah, you know, it helps me sleep at night. You know, it, it, at this point, like I, that's how I look at it. I'm continuing to sell my covered calls against to trying to lower my cost basis uh, even further. But it's not something where I want to overexpose myself because if I overexpose myself, then I'm I'm more likely to get emotionally invested in it and do something silly as far as like the, the position itself. Um, you know, someone that said like, oh, the way that you guys talk about Alibaba must be like significant portion of their worth, and like. I want to say I calculated it and it was like 2% of my like household net worth or something ridiculous like that. Um, that's why I've kept my position small. I only own like 140 shares. Um, the, it just allows you to have more peace of mind and to have that confidence. And like, this is what the numbers say. The numbers say it's a good investment to buy at this point. And I continue to stick with that based upon that thesis. Unless I see something degrade meaningfully, um, I'm you know, hopeful that we'll have some easing tensions between the U.S. and China and that, you know, globally, there'll be, you know, kind of a more uh, peaceful times and that eventually the, the Chinese economy will come through this phase where real estate has been a real uh, problem uh, for them, real you know, headwind. And they will go back to a, you know, kind of regular growth where consumers feel confident and, you know, are able to spend money and on platforms like Alibaba. And that's that's my hope and my, my underlying investment thesis still to this day. So still pro 10 years. Yep, exactly. Yeah, me too. I have no idea what my net worth is. Do you actually take the time to, to do your net worth? Yeah, yeah, on occasion I will. Not like, not like, I have no often, idea. But every like, I don't know, six months or so. I've never done it. All right. Uh, no, I've never done it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I have uh, 380 shares of Baba. I don't know. Nice. Yeah. But my cost is like 100 bucks or something. I don't know. I have to check it. I don't remember. Um, yeah. I'm too afraid to do covered calls because it's, uh, it's really jumpy, but we will see. Let us know what you guys think. If some of you are calling it or buying more, I'm probably going to buy more. Catch you next time.